Hello everyone, welcome to Bit of Anatomy. In this tutorial, we will see the features of Osteology of the Skull. So the Osteology of the Skull has the external features of the skull as a whole, which study in various normas or various views. So if we study the skull from the front part, it is called normal frontalis. From the lateral part, it is normal lateralis. From the posterior part, it is normal occipitalis. From the basal part or the inferior part, it is normal basalis. And from the top part, when the calvary is intact, it is called as the norma verticalis. So in the norma basalis, we study the norma basalis under various subheadings, the anterior part, the intermediate part, which again contains the median and the lateral parts, and the posterior part. So the anterior part, it is demarked or it is separated from the middle part by the posterior border of the heart palate. So it mainly contains the hard palate and the alveolar process. The bones that are present here are the palatine process of the maxilla bone, the alveolar process of the maxilla bone, horizontal process of the horizontal plate of the palatine bone. This alveolar process, it carries the socket for the teeth. With In the adults, it is 2, 1, 2, 3, the dental formula, 2 incisors, 1 canine, two premolars and three molars. So if you see the hard palate, the anterior two-third of the hard palate, it is formed by the maxilla bone and the posterior one-third is formed by the palate bone. And in between the two bones, there will be a suture in the shape of a plus or cruciform shaped suture. So the anterior two-third, there is a suture which is called as the intermaxillary, this is the interpalatine and this is the palato maxillary suture. And if you see the surface of this ear, we can see numerous small pit-like uh, structures that we can appreciate in the uh, surface of the hard palate. So this surface actually forms the roof of the oral cavity and these small pits, they contain the various palatine glands. So if you appreciate in the anterior part of this uh, hard palate, in the midline there is a larger fossa here which is called as the incisive fossa. So developmentally this part of the maxilla in front of the incisive fossa which carries the four incisor teeth, it develops from the pre-maxilla whereas the remaining part develops from the definitive maxilla. So inside this incisive fossa there will be incisive canals which carries greater palatine vessels and also the nasopalatine Now The greater palatine Vessels, they pass from the palate to the nasal cavity, where that's the nasopalatine or the spinopalatine nerve, it passes from nasal cavity to the palate. So in the posterior part, if we appreciate, we can see the one more foramen here. So it is called as the greater palatine foramen. So this greater palatine foramen, it transmits the greater palatine vessels. So those greater palatine vessels, it passes through the groove over the surface of the hard palate and enters the nose through the incisive fossa. And behind this greater palatine foramen, we can see few smaller lesser palatine foramen, which transmits the nerves and vessels of the same name. So in the posterior border, if we appreciate that horizontal plate of palatine bone on of both sides, they meet at the midpoint to form a projection called as the posterior nasal spine. This whole border, it provides attachment to the palatine aponeurosis of the soft palate and some of the muscles of the soft palate. So these are the features in the anterior part of the norma basalis. So next, if we appreciate the features in the middle part of the norma basalis. So the middle part extends from posterior border of the hard palate till an imaginary line extending from the anterior border of the foramen magnum. So in the Median plane, we can see the posterior nasal openings or the coene. So, and in between, there is part of the nasal septum, the bone called as the omer. So, this bone in the inferior aspect, so it attaches to the hard palate, whereas superiorly, as you can appreciate here, it divides into two parts which articulates with the, which are called as the ala of the omer bone, which articulates with the rostrum of sphenoid. And this cornea on the other side, it is bounded by the medial pterygoid plate. So there are two pterygoid plates here, the medial pterygoid plate and the lateral pterygoid plate. This medial pterygoid plate, when raised downwards, it 
forms a projection which is which has got cut here which is called as the pterygoid hamulus and if it raise it upwards it divides into a small triangular fossa called as the scaphoid fossa which provides origin to the tensor valley palatini muscle so this tensor valley palatini muscle it uses this uh, pterygoid hamulus and it turns around to enter into the soft palate forming the palatine aponeurosis and near the omer and the sphenoid bone there are various uh, canals or foramens called as the omerovaginal canal and the palatinovaginal canal so coming back to the pterygoid plates so medial pterygoid plate and this is the lateral pterygoid plate and this lateral pterygoid plate the medial surface of the lateral pterygoid plate it provides origin to the medial pterygoid muscle and the lateral surface it provides origin to the lateral pterygoid muscle remember the medial pterygoid will not arise from the medial pterygoid plate both the medial and lateral pterygoid plate they originate from the lateral pterygoid plate so behind this omer so here is a bar of bone so which extends from the omer bone till the foramen magnum so this is formed by the fused parts of the basi occiput and the basi sphenoid and it presents a small projection in the mid midline which is called as pharyngeal tubercle this pharyngeal tubercle it provides attachment to the median fibrous raphe of the pharynx and also some of the superior fibers of the superior constrictor muscle or upper fibers of the superior constrictor muscle they get inserted into the pharyngeal tubercle so these are the major features in the median plane we will see the cornea bounded by the omer and also the medial pterygoid plate so pterygoid plates of the sphenoid bone which contains a medial and a lateral one which provides origin to the pterygoid muscles and in the mid plane there is basi occiput and the basi sphenoid which fuses to form this uh, bar of the bone here which contains pharyngeal tubercle in the median plane come to the features of the lateral aspect of the middle part so it contains the pterygoid plates it contains the infratemporal surface of the sphenoid bone the mandibular fossa formed by various parts of the temporal bone the petrous part of the temporal bone every irregular bone here the styloid process let's see the features in the infratemporal surface so this infratemporal surface of the sphenoid bone it actually forms the superior boundary for the infratemporal fossa so part of it it also forms the boundaries of the orbit and this surface it presents a small projection here which is called as the infratemporal crest which provides origin to one of the heads of the lateral pterygoid and this infratemporal surface of the sphenoid bone posteriorly it articulates with the temporal bone here and medially it comes in contact with the petrous part of the temporal bone so it presents various foramens in this region so now i think it's appreciable in a better way so just behind this pterygoid plates we can see a larger oval foramen which is called as the foramen oval and behind that there is a foramen called as the foramen spinosum so if you appreciate this foramen oval it communicates the infratemporal fossa with the middle cranial cavity and even the foramen spinosum communicates the infratemporal fossa with the middle cranial cavity so basically there are four major structure passing through the foramen oval is remembered as male structures the mandibular nerve the accessory meningeal artery the lesser petrosal nerve and the emissary vein whereas the foramen spinosum it helps in the transmission of uh, middle meningeal vessels and also the nervous spinosus which is a branch of the mandibular nerve so sometimes there will be additional uh, foramen here like canaliculus innominatus or foramen of vesalius foramen of vesalius when present it transmits the emissary veins whereas the canaliculus innominatus it transmits the lesser petrosal nerve so if it is present the lesser petrosal nerve will not pass through the foramen oval it will pass through the canaliculus innominatus so just behind the foramen spinosum there is a small projection here 
so which is known as spine of the spinoid bone. So this spine of the spinoid bone, it provides attachment to the anterior ligament of malleus, the spinomandibular ligament and pterygospinous ligament. At the junction of the infratemporal surface of the spinoid bone and the petrous part of the temporal bone, so there is a small depression here which is called as sulcus tubae. So this sulcus tube, it some of the part provides origin to the tibetar wavy peritone and it lodges the auditory tube. So that's why it is called as sulcus tube since it lodges the tube in this region. So next if we see the lateral just behind the infratemporal surface, there is this depression called as the mandibular fossa. So this mandibular fossa, it is formed by the anteriorly by the squamous part of the temporal bone and posteriorly it is formed by the tympanic plate of the temporal bone. And in between the two there is a fissure called as the squamotympanic fissure which is divided into an anterior and a posterior part, the petrosquamous and the petrotympanic fissure. The petrotympanic fissure it transmits the anterior ligament of the malleus and also the corda tympani now. So out of this the only the squamous part or the anterior part of the mandibular fossa, it articulates with the TM or it articulates with the mandible forming the temporomandibular joint. So this is the articular part and this is the non-articular part. So if you see the features in relation to the petrous part of the temporal bone which is an irregular bone here, so anteriorly it meets with the spinoid bone where there is a large gap called as the foramen lecidum. So this foramen Lecidum in life it is closed by a fibrocartilage and in its posterior wall it has got the anterior opening of the carotid canal and anteriorly it presents one more canal so which is called as the pterygoid canal which opens up anteriorly into the pterygopalatine fossa. So nothing passes through this except some minor branches of the arteries whereas in the upper part it contains the internal carotid artery the greater palatine nerves, the nerve to pterygoid canal. So if you see the petrous part of the temporal bone, it has got one more opening here called as the carotid canal. So carotid canal passes through this, it passes inside the petrous part of the temporal bone. So this carotid canal, as the name suggests, it transmits the internal carotid artery along with some sympathetic plexus of nerves around the internal carotid artery. And at the junction of so at the junction of the petrous part of the temporal bone and also the occipital bone, we can see one more larger foramen here, which is called as the jugular foramen. So this jugular foramen it communicates this normal basalis or the inferior of the skull with the posterior cranial fossa. So this jugular foramen it transmits the 9th, 10th and 11th cranial nerves and also the jugu internal jugular vein begins from this region. It has got a small depressed fossa here, so which lodges the bulb of the internal jugular vein. So and there is this styloid process, so which is a projection coming from the junction of the tympanic plate of the temporal bone and this styloid process it provides attachment to various muscles and the ligaments forming the styloid apparatus. So some of the muscles attached to it are the stylohyoid, the styloglossus and the stylopharyngeus and the ligaments are the stylohyoid ligament and stylomandibular ligament. So these are the major features that we can appreciate in the middle part. So there are various bones, the infratemporal surface of the spinoid, the mandibular fossa formed by various parts of the temporal bone, petrous part of temporal bone, the styloid process of the temporal bone, the basi spinoid and the basi occiput, the omer and the pterygoid processes of the spinoid bone. So major foramens in these regions are the foramen ovale, foramen spinosum, foramen lecidum, the carotid canal and the jugular foramen.
Now we'll the features of the posterior part of the Norma base alveolus. So posterior part demarcation is an imaginary line extending from the anterior margin of the foramen magnum. So if you see here, even the styloid process and the jugular foramen, it comes in the posterior part, which I already described uh, while describing the petrous part of the temporal bone. So if you see the major feature, there is one large foramen which no one can miss. So this is the foramen magnum that is present in the occipital bone. So most of the posterior part is formed by the occipital bone and this occipital bone it articulates with the mastoid process of the temporal bone and also the petrous part of the temporal bone. So if you see the foramen magnum, so there are various uh, structures passing through the foramen magnum from the anterior part it, the apical ligament of the dense and the membrana tectoria will pass whereas from the posterior part the medulla oblongata continuous as spinal cord here and the tonsils of the cerebrum is related and the spinal root of the accessory nerve the anterior and posterior spinal arteries the vertebral arteries are some of the structures that passes through the foramen magnum so here we can see two condyles which are kidney shaped called as the occipital condyles so these condyles they articulate with the condyles or the superior condyles of the atlas bone or the first cervical vertebra forming the atlanto occipital joint. So posteriorly we can appreciate a fossa just behind the occipital condyle. Sometimes there will be a foramen in this fossa and at the junction just above this occipital condyle so we can see a foramen so which is called as the hypoglossal canal. So as the name suggests, so this hypoglossal canal, it transmits the nerve of the same name, that is the hypoglossal nerve. So next if we see the lateral part, so there is this mastoid process which receives the attachment of various muscles like the sternocleidomastoid. Just medial to the mastoid process, there is mastoid notch which provides origin to the posterior belly of the digastric muscle. Still medial to that at the junction of the occipital bone and also the mastoid process of the temporal bone, there is one more groove which allows the passage of the occipital artery. Between the mastoid process and the styloid process, we can appreciate a foramen, so named as stylomastoid foramen. So this stylomastoid foramen, it transmits some stylomastoid vessels which enters through this and the facial nerve exits through the stylomastoid for Ammon. So if you see the rest of the features, so extending from the posterior margin of the foramen magnum, there is a crest called as the external occipital crest, which ends up in the external occipital protuberance. So the prominent point over the external occipital protuberance, it is called as enion. From this external occipital protuberance, we can see two lines called as the superior nuchal line, which demarcates the head from the neck region. And below this, we can see the inferior nuchal line. So if you see the attachments to this area, the area between the superior nuchal line and also the inferior nuchal line uh, provides attachment to the semispinalis capitis. And beneath this, there is rectus capitis posterior minor, rectus capitis posterior major, and the superior oblique capitis muscle. So that means all these muscles, they are part of the suboccipital triangle. Whereas this superior nuchal line, it provides attachment to the trapezius muscle in the medial part, whereas in the lateral part, in continuity with the mastoid process, the sternocleidomastoid muscle will insert. And also this provides attachment to the ligamentum nuchae. So here we can also appreciate one mastoid foramen. So this is an emissary foramen which transmits the emissary vein. So these are the features in the posterior part, foramen magnum the occipital condyles, the jugular foramen, the stylomastoid process, the stylomastoid foramen, the mastoid process, mastoid notch, the notch for the occipital artery, the external occipital protuberance, external occipital crest, superior nuchal line and the inferior nuchal line. So these are the various features of the Norma basalis. Do subscribe for future updates. Thank you.